Hello, Achim Mikarim. This is another Hidush answering a uh, good set of questions that someone in the group uh, posted in regards to the uh, dream, or the not the dream, the um, near-death experience that the young Israeli boy had uh, just about maybe six months ago or so about the uh, what's happening or what's going to happen in the end of days and how he, uh, according to uh, his understanding, he uh, believes that it's going to happen any minute, meaning in the next few months or perhaps now. And uh, if this is indeed the end of days, then uh, what should we do? Should we all move to Israel? And the third part of the question was that uh, if this doesn't happen, then um, what does it say about the boy's rabbi? So... First and foremost, we should all understand, as I mentioned in previous lectures, that uh, the end of days, as far as what's going to happen to the end of days, we are certain that it's already happening now, because the Torah, the uh, you know books of prophets, you know in Zechariah and Ezekiel, uh, in a uh, also in the Gemara, the Oral Torah, and the uh, end of uh, the uh, tractate of Sota, page forty nine. Uh, and in several other parts of the Torah, it describes the things, the signs we're going to have at the end of days, before the Mashiach arrives. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the teachings we had uh, was we went over each and every single part of the uh, signs, so-called signs, that the uh, Gemara and Sota says we're going to have before the end of days. And uh, for anyone that wants to watch this you, or I'll post it shortly after I post this Hidush, it's literally like reading the newspaper, uh, whether it's uh, inflation or a generation full of rude people or constant problems in Shlombait, not because of the husband and wife, but rather because of the in-laws. Uh, the, uh, you know, there's just constant different issues, different things that were not found in previous generations. Uh, you know, modesty being something that's a, uh, you know, uh, frowned upon, you know, in the, if you look at just not even that far away, if you just look at your grandparents, whether Jewish or non-Jewish people that lived a, just a couple of generations ago, everyone was modest. Everyone was modest. It wasn't like a, uh, a something that only the Jews kept. It was just a, that was the standard. If you even look to this day, you look at the Queen of England. She covers her hair. She covers her body. She doesn't walk around with a mini skirt. She doesn't walk around with tight clothes. She doesn't walk around with uh, tank tops and short skirts. She's modest. Anyone with a little bit of self-respect knows that modesty is a very, very important thing, especially for women. But men also, as we've talked about in lectures, are also supposed to be modest. That's why they're not allowed to uh, wear these uh, skinny pants and, and, and clothes that are exposing themselves and their bodies. But nonetheless, the, uh, there are many, many signs that just 50 or 60 years ago we did not have. And uh, today we have all of them, including things that are very, very rare, uh, like the uh, red cow. You know, one of the things that's going to happen before the end of the days is that we have to have a red cow. Because that is the only way that we can service in, in the Bet HaMikdash. Because the red cow needs to be slaughtered in a kosher way. And then after that, burned. And the ashes are used to purify the nation. You know, and there's not that many red cows throughout history. I believe until, point, until this point there was only eight red cows throughout history. And uh, if you actually look on YouTube, you can find or you could type in red heifer or red cow. And you'll see actually that there is a red cow in the world today and it's being preserved and kept. As a matter of fact, they say that there's two. One of them uh, was a uh, Jewish guy in uh, New Jersey, uh, had him and he actually got that red cow uh, delivered and donated, even though they offered him millions of dollars uh, to, uh, the, uh, to Israel, to Am Israel, and it actually was moved to Israel. And there's actually another one that they say was in an undisclosed location somewhere also in America. Uh, so nonetheless, we know for sure that we have at least one red cow, if not more. There's videos out there that I've posted on my uh, Facebook for anyone that wants to uh, look at them. Or if anyone wants it, I could send it to them.
But anyway, we have that sign. We have the signs of modesty where we knew everyone was modest. We have, uh, you know, the also one of the prophecies is that going to be people that say the truth are going to be despised. You know, we tell people the truth, they have to do tshuva, that a Jew that doesn't keep Shabbat is not considered Jewish according to Allah. You know, the, the, all these things that are sometimes hard to hear uh, is obviously only this generation is in a situation where it's hard to hear it. In previous generations, everyone was religious. It was just a standard. So we have constant signs and last but not least, one of the signs that I like, uh, you know, myself, is strange sounds around the world. You could type this again also on YouTube, and you see people from all over the world, mostly not Jewish, some of them Jewish, are recording these strange sounds that sound like a shofar, like a horn, uh, just blowing in the middle of the sky. And it's strange and scary, but you see this, it's happening all over the world. It's not just happening in one location where it could be staged. You know, this is happening and these people have no clue about these prophecies. They're not talking about prophecy. They're not talking about uh, God. They're not talking about anything. They're just going outside and they hear this enormous sound that's shaking up the ground. And this is, again, one of the prophecies. So everything that Hashem said was going to happen before the Mashiach come, comes is happening. With the exception of one thing, which is the Mashiach himself. He hasn't arrived yet. So when the boy was saying everything that's going to happen further, which is the uh, the war of Gogu Magog, the, uh, the scary war where two-thirds of the world get eliminated, according to the uh, Rizal, they'll be eliminated in uh, eight minutes, which in his days, if you would have said that, you know the world that that many people would die in eight minutes it didn't sound rational didn't sound possible because the best weapon they had back then was a spear so even if you threw you know a billion spears uh you know you still have <laughs> billions of uh, and you hit every single target you still wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't succeed so uh again today we understand that this is very much unfortunately possible through nuclear weapons and as it says in the, uh, the by the prophets that then it describes a nuclear weapon where it says that the skin will melt and the eyes of those obviously that are killed during this war are going to uh pour out of their uh out of their heads like water so obviously scary scary stuff and in those days again in the days of ezekiel and days of zachariah this stuff wasn't possible in the days of just even a hundred years ago this wasn't possible today we know it's very much possible it's a exact definition of what happens in a nuclear war so everything that this boy said was not new it's already been written over three thousand years ago nothing new zero new so whether it come true right comes to fruition right now in six months from now in six years from now in 20 years from now we don't know now so according to what he says his understanding was that but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen it's happened it's happened many times throughout history the people that are much much more righteous than he could uh that he is or even could ever be uh not to discount him but just people like rabbi akiva one of the greatest sages and minds that ever lived uh you know uh, actually had his own understanding of when the mashiach comes and uh he made a mistake he actually made a mistake to such an extent that he taught that this bar koziva his name his real name was bar kochba was the mashiach because he had superhuman powers but he ended up being not only not the mashiach he wasn't even a tzaddik and he actually at the end of his life ended up converting to islam uh and uh, became a complete heretic so but torbi akiva saw that he had superhuman powers he said oh this is the mashiach so sometimes people get dreams sometimes they even get a partial prophecy sometimes they get an understanding but hashem can always change things he allows people to see things and even the righteous people that even in just uh, the past couple of generations saw that the mashiach is literally already here but then it didn't happen it doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't see what they saw it doesn't even necessarily mean that they were wrong it just means that Hashem decided to show them something in order to move the nation, in order to put some urgency on the nation because to do tshuva takes time. 
doing chuva is not something you do one, two, three, and you do chuva. It's not a hot dog that you buy at a store. It's not a, uh, a burger. It, doing chuva is a process. And it has to start now in order for you to be ready for when the Mashiach comes. Anyone that's not already doing tshuva is mamash playing with their own life. It's going to take time for you to learn what to do. Even if you want to do tshuva. Even if you're ready to do tshuva. Realize it's going to take time to fully do tshuva because it takes time to learn what to do. And if you're not keeping Shabbat by the time the Mashiach comes, if you're not keeping family purity by the time Mashiach comes, if you're still chash v'shalom, wasting seed by the time the Mashiach comes, there's no hope for you. This is a reality. This is not the scary, this is just a reality. This is what God says. There's no more tshuva or conversions once the Mashiach arrives. So Hashem wants to make sure, okay, you're ready to do tshuva, but you're not ready to keep Shabbat yet. Okay, so do tshuva. And start washing your hands after you eat, uh, after you go to the bathroom and before you eat. Do Birkat Amazon. Do a blessing after you eat. You know, start laying tefillin if you're a male, uh, you know, every day, every morning except Shabbat. Start observing the holidays. Bezat Hashem, start keeping Shabbat. Start keeping kosher all the time, not just sometimes. It takes time to know what to do. And the reality of it is that sometimes he's going to send us a message early to shake us up. Because technically, the Mashiach can come any day, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to come today or when this boy said it. So he sent this message to sages in the past several times uh, in order to shake up the nation and to get them ready. Because also, as we've said in different lectures, everyone has to realize that their own personal judgment day could arrive at any given day. This is why if you see every major sage that ever wrote anything, always talks about death every one of them has always talked about death at some point or another you know and so if you think about it why are they being so morbid why are they talking about death so much because that's your personal judgment day that's the day that whether the mashiach arrived or not that's your day that's your personal mashiach you arrive you're in front of the bed dean of shamayim the judges of shamayim and they look at every single thing that you ever did whether it's steal five cents from somebody or it's a uh, violate Shabbat, chash v'shalom. That's your judgment day. No one knows how long they're going to live. Everyone always says until 120, and Be'ezat Hashem it is until 120. But unfortunately, I know personally many people that have died in their 20s, in their 30s, friend, old friends of mine from high school, they're no longer here. So to think that you have uh, eternal life or you're going to live another 50 years and you could just wait is an illusion. You're playing with a time, you're playing with a time bomb. So... Tshuva has to start immediately. Why? Because your own personal Mashiach could arrive at any given day. If it's not the case, and the actual real Mashiach arrives, and you're not ready, you're going to be in deep trouble, and that trouble could potentially, chas shalom, be eternal trouble. If you're still worshipping idols like JC, or you're in uh, still uh, you know eating taref if you're a Jew, uh, or if you're if you're still doing things that are against Hashem outright that He says specifically in the Torah not to do, uh, some of these sins are not forgivable. In you know unless they're unless someone already does repentance in this world. Once you get to the real world, the eternal world, there's no more repentance over there because then there's no test. So you can't play with time. So as far as this kid, if it happens or it doesn't happen, as we've just learned, it doesn't really matter uh, whether it happens or now in six months or it happens in six years from now. We are still obligated to do tshuva. We are still obligated to do the will of Hashem every single day. Uh, as far as whether it's going to happen or not, I think as far as I know, every major mind, every major tzaddik, every major speaker out there that talks about Mashiach, is under the same notion that since we have pretty much every single sign that the Torah said we're going to have before the end of days, uh, then really this is not just a uh, you know wishful thinking that the Mashiach is going to arrive soon, but rather it's a certainty that he's going to arrive in our generation. Whether that's six months from now or six years from now, we don't know, but it's definitely possible that he's going to arrive at any given moment and we have to be ready for it. So as far as this kid getting his insight, it may perhaps be that it's really happening. Uh, or it may be just to alert the nation. And if he was able to get even one person, just one person to do tshuva, it was already worth it for Hashem to do it. And obviously, as we have know, many people started 
checking themselves and uh, and starting to do tshuva more than just one person. So just for that, we already know this is a tool that Hashem has used in the past. It's a real tool. It's not to fool people into doing something bad, but rather to get people just like this parasha. Uh, this week, the Chukotai speaks about it's Hashem is giving us, you know, all all of these curses, not to destroy us, but rather to make us do tshuva, to make us do to repent and fulfill our fulfill our obligation. As far as should we all move to Israel, this is not a tough question. This is a, actually a very easy question because someone needs to understand that since we've just learned, your full purpose is to do the will of Hashem. Then that means that you have to live where you are closest to Hashem. If you are religious here, you're doing tshuva, even if you were born religious, you still need to do tshuva every day. Every one of us needs to do tshuva every day. Every one of us. Uh, so uh, even if they're already keeping mitzvot in their own level, they have to get stronger. Uh, if they're not, then obviously, uh, they have to keep a lot more mitzvot. But the point is, is that you have to be wherever you are closest to Hashem. Sometimes people live outside of Israel, and they're closer to they do tshuva in america in australia in canada in different places around the world but uh, then they go back up to eretz israel they start seeing you know some people are religious some people are not religious and they start feeling comfortable with the non-religious world and they fall off chas v'shalom. so uh chas v'shalom means god forbid so uh in essence it's a uh, it's not good for them to go to israel on the other hand, some people that live in Israel are very religious. They go to America, or they go to Canada, they go to different places, and they become one of the goyim. Obviously, for them, it's not good to be outside of Israel. So you have to be where it's easiest for you to be religious, where you're closest to Hashem. If you have good panasa wherever you live, if you have shalom bayit where you live, if you have, uh, you know, Hashem, you know, as part permanent part of your daily life, then live exactly where you live. You don't need to go anywhere. If you think that you'll get better by going somewhere else and the family agrees, especially, you know, obviously your wife, not kids, not necessarily, it's, it's under your own hands. You can't listen to your kids. Uh, you have to listen to the superiors, the, the parents that know what uh, what's really important in life, not because the kid has a few friends here and they don't want to let go. Because we all know, as we've all grown up, that your friends at fifth grade, for most of the time, you're not really friends with them anymore. When you grow up, people move on. So you have to listen to the parents that have some wisdom, that have some experience. And if your wife or your husband agrees, uh, and you think that it's going to be, you're going to be able to have panasa, you're going to be able to have the kedusha, you're going to have Torah as permanent part of your life, and you'll be even more religious in Israel, then yes, by all means, you should definitely go to Israel. Uh, rabbis like Rabbi Alon and Ava have already moved back to Israel, and uh, it's amazing. I wish we were all in Israel, but again, it's you have to make sure that you live wherever you are closest to Hashem, where you personally feel closer to Hashem. It's easier for you to be closer to Hashem, it's because even if the war of Gog and Magog happens, regardless of where you are, Hashem will protect you. Hashem is not limited to just Israel. Of course, Israel has its own kedusha, uh, has its own benefit, its own uh, significance. But again, this does not mean that everyone should move to Israel if they're not going to be more religious there. Last but not least, what does it say about the boy's rabbi, even though we've technically answered it already? It says nothing about the boy's rabbi. The boy's rabbi was just asking the, the boy questions, and the boy was answering him. It has nothing to do with the rabbi, whether this prophecy, dream, illusion, whatever it is, ends up coming true, has nothing to do with the rabbi. The rabbi just heard things that were extraordinary and wanted to report it to the people. Uh, and uh, that's it. He didn't. He's he's been teaching it because he's been teaching Torah for over twenty years. This is what Hashem said. This is nothing new. So it says nothing to discredit the Rabbi Chas Shalom. He was telling us what we already should have known, and if we don't know, then he gave us some new. You know, he gave us chidush. He gave us a new insight. But technically, nothing was new, uh, as the Rabbi himself said during the lectures. So. Most important thing that everyone needs to learn from all of this is that, yes, it could be that the Mashiach is going to come at any given moment. That's actually an obligation of one of the 13 principles of faith. They're going to ask everyone that when they go to Shemaim, where are you expecting Mashiach? And you literally have to expect Mashiach. But what it means is that, not that you literally expect Mashiach to arrive at your personal doorfront tomorrow, but rather that you lived your life 
in a way where you are ready for Mashiach to come any moment by your actions, not just belief. Believing in your believing in your heart means nothing. Believing in your actions is what it uh, what's significant. And that's why it says in this week's parasha, "Im bechukotai telechu." If you walked with my laws, not if you just kept them. If you walked them, meaning everywhere you went, the laws of God went with you. You weren't just religious at home, you were religious in your business, you were religious in your vacation, you were religious in every single place, you were religious. Uh, so this is a, Hashem has to be with you everywhere. Um, so as far as the rabbi, I think he's amazing that he uh, posted this and allowed the world to get some insight of what's really happening out there. Personally, I believe the Mashiach is extremely close, literally can come any given day, and that's not necessarily just because of all of the prophecies, which are more than enough for anyone with a little bit of seche, a little bit of common sense to know that the Mashiach is around the corner, if not already here. But if you just look to, look at the world around you, you see that you know Russia, before they arrived in Syria, before they actually sent their soldiers, before they sent their tanks, before they sent their planes, they arrived with a giant ship full of 200 atomic bombs. Now, if anyone wants to believe the foolishness that they are trying to make people believe that it's just a, uh, you know, they're trying to fight ISIS, then uh, I can't help you because you're too much of a fool. Uh, the reality of it is you don't need 200 atomic bombs to fight ISIS. You don't need even one atomic bomb to fight ISIS. You go with 200 atomic bombs because it's not just about ISIS. And that's why, surely, this was back in September of last year. And just recently, about two months ago, Russia, as if 200 atomic bombs were not enough, and the planes and tanks and jeeps and everything else that they brought there was not enough, they brought another submarine, which is the biggest submarine in the world, to the same location with even more atomic bombs. We don't even know how much. That's how many there are. So obviously, <laughs> they're not preparing for ISIS. They're preparing for something much more significant. And that's why you're seeing the entire world, including the United States, heat up. Everyone wants to fight. There's like At any given moment, as the British uh, Times said a few months ago, we're 30 seconds away from a world war. In reality, we already started the world war. It just a um, it's just quiet for now, just like World War One and World War Two were. They were very quiet for a while until everyone got involved and Hashem and Hashem what happened. So uh, we see that everything is happening. It's still quiet, but at any given moment, something big can start. Whether you live in Israel or you live in America or you live in Germany or you live in Australia doesn't actually matter as much as what are your actions. Are you making Hashem a permanent part of your life every day and preparing yourself for Mashiach or are you still just living on borrowed time? This is a question only you can answer and I would suggest obviously you start making your life more useful more fulfilling and ultimately you'll have a lot more blessing anyway while we're still in this world so this is not to scare anyone but rather to wake you up to realize that whether it's the mashiach that hashem promised us many times throughout the torah that's going to bring salvation to the world or it's going to be your own personal mashiach which is doomsday for what people look at it but in reality it's the beginning of the next world if you did good things then it's the beginning of eternal greatness if you didn't then uh, may hashem you know have mercy on you but according to the torah there are certain sins that he cannot have mercy uh, on someone because it's a uh, it's against his own torah so keep shabbat keep kosher keep tarat mishpacha keep learning torah and fulfill your obligation in the world and you won't have to worry about when Judgment Day is coming, when the Mashiach is coming, because you're already ready. May Hashem bless all of you, give you Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Mevorach, and make your way and your thoughts and your journey a lot clearer to get to the ultimate destination of Kedusha. Kol Tuv.